you make your way back to your seat. You guys love the fellowship. That's a good thing. <laughs> That's a good thing. Make your way back. Amen. Hey, we want to take just a few moments while you're making your way back to your seat. We want to honor today our very special people today, our VIPs. That is our guests that are with us this morning. If you are a special guest with us, we want to thank you for being part of our worship service today here at Stewart Road. Can we give it up for them today? Any guests, we thank you today. Amen. Amen. And you can scan a QR code or a text. Let us know that you came. At our Welcome Center, there is a gift bag that we have for you. We have a special gift that we want to give you. So please don't leave without us giving that. And we just, we don't want your information so that we'll bug you, but we do want to pray for you. And you can also go to our Welcome Center and fill out any prayer requests that you have. I know the little black books are not there anymore, but there is still available for you at the Welcome Center so that you can uh, let us know. And you can also, on our website or, uh, and, and by the way, we are getting ready to have a brand new app. Isn't that awesome? We're going to have an app on our phone that's going to where you'll have all our sermons. It'll be there for you to give, and so we're preparing to do that. Lots of good things coming up, but we thank God for that. And we have another special group. We have an online campus. I mean, people that watch all over the world. Uh, I know this uh, today, there are going to be people all over uh, Kuwait that are part of the world. Uh, they wanted to know our information. So we just are, are now a church. If we have it before, we're going to be truly reaching the world. Amen. So we thank you, online campus for watching today here in Michigan. God bless you. And so we honor that group today as well. Well, I just want to make a few uh, uh, notes of announcements, and then we're going to dive in today. Um, I want to first of all give a great shout out to those that worked at the uh, uh, U of M football this Saturday. We had a lot of people out there today. It was a very hard and long day. But all of that money is going to bless us, so we thank God for that. Uh, and then we also need this Saturday nine more for the 23rd and two more for this coming Saturday. So two more volunteers this Saturday and then nine more for the 23rd. And then Michigan doesn't play for uh, a few weeks. Now, this is a great opportunity to bless our church. And I want to tell you what we're going to be doing with that. Um, we're going to be taking those funds that are coming in, and we are remodeling our gymnasium. Can somebody thank God for that? Amen. Praise God. We have, it's going to cost about $30,000 to remodel our gymnasium. We're going to relaunch in October, I believe it's October, or is it October? October 1st, we're relaunching our youth ministry on Sunday nights. Woo, come on, somebody. On Sunday nights, it's going to be awesome. We are gonna, we're gonna turn that, now is it over there? I thought so. Y'all gotta pray for me. I'm telling you, I'm in a new time zone. My brain is foggy, so just I'm telling you, God will help me today with his anointing. But uh, we are, we're gonna be painting in there. Uh, we're, we're putting a new stage in there. Uh, we are new sound equipment. It is just, we're investing into this generation. And I, I believe and we're praying on October 1st that we're going to have 100 students on worship that Sunday night. Praise the Lord for that. And so uh, we're going to take the funds that come in uh, for this fundraiser uh, to help remodel our gymnasium. Now, the gymnasium is still going to be used for, as a multi-life facility, family life facility during the week for various different groups and food. But uh, on Sunday nights, it's going to be all youth. And so we're so excited about it. Amen. Praise to God. And so uh, please support us. Uh, volunteer. I know it's a long day, but it's just a, it's a short season. It truly is. And so if you can help, we are so grateful for that. And then um, also, I'm going to talk to you about Kuwait in a minute, but I want to mention to you uh, that Dr. Jeff and his missions trip, uh, his team is getting ready to go to Panama this coming week. And so let's pray for them. Matter of fact, let's do it now. Uh, is there anybody in here going on that trip? They left today. Well, you're not going on that trip then, are you? <laughs> you're here with us. But uh, can we pray for them? 
Is that good? Let's do it right now. Father, we pray uh, for, for, for Dr. Jeff. We pray for his team that are headed to Panama. We pray your anointing and your hand of protection through immigration and through all the ordeals that they have to go through. We pray for strength. And Lord, we pray for a great report of many people touched, lives changed and impacted, all because God of Stuart Road and the passion for missions. We cover them under the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we praise God for that? Hallelujah. And then the last big announcement that I just want to mention to you is September 27th. That's going to be our night of vision where we're going to look back and ahead. So we're going to look back at the, your financial giving. We'll share a little bit of the business side uh, quickly through a PowerPoint presentation. We'll share about our missions giving. We'll, share, we'll give a report of different ministries that all the things that we did back this past year uh, because the uh, fiscal year runs from June to June. And so we look back at, at the previous June of June. And so that's going to be exciting. And then I'm going to cast vision not only that Wednesday night, but I'm going to cast vision for our church that following Sunday, which is October 1st. And I'm going to be sharing all about some great things. I'm going to talk about legacy and how God wants us to be a legacy church. And I'm just changing the terminology. Usually, I think uh, Pastor Keith called it heart for the house. We're just going to change the terminology to legacy 23 and 24, standing for the 23rd and 24th of 2023-2024 year. And what God wants us to do and invest in financially for the legacy, which means the future of our church. So it's going to be very exciting. Those are days that you don't want to miss because you are going to hear all about where we're headed. Amen? And so we thank God for that. It's so good to be with you this morning. I'm thrilled. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad to be home. <laughs> oh, it feels great. It feels great. I had preached over 20 times this past week. And so my voice is, is, is pretty weak right now. But God did a great work in Kuwait. And um, I'm so grateful for the time that I had there. And, and I, I challenged at the Church of God congregations with, a, I believe, a powerful word. And many, many, many people came to me for just needing healings and different things. And so we saw God move in the altar. It was a great time in the Lord. I want to thank you for allowing me and sending me and helping me go. Uh, I appreciate you allow, allowing me to go away, especially since I just got here. So I want to give you a thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for allowing me to go. All right, let's dive into the Word of God this morning. I want to share from the book of Nehemiah. By the way, this is the last Sunday that we are going to be in Nehemiah. Next Sunday, we start a brand new series from the book of Daniel. And we're going to talk about next week and, and the continuing weeks about thriving in Babylon. How do we thrive in Babylon? How do we thrive in a culture that is against us? And so it's going to be powerful. I'm telling you, it's going to be a great series. We're going to look at how Daniel survived and thrived in Babylon and how we can survive and thrive in our culture today, even though our culture is against us. God's kingdom still works. Amen? Can we thank God for that? God's kingdom still moves. and that. So that starts next week. So we're wrapping up Nehemiah today. And I want to pray as I get started. Father, I thank you for the next few moments. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you, God, that you desire to do a great work in Stuart Road and the hearts of your people. Thank you for unity. Thank you for purpose. Thank you that you've called us to make a difference Thank you that you have called heaven to earth. Thank you that you desire to do great things, not just good things, but great things at Stewart Road in Monroe. And today we pray for Monroe. We pray for the great state of Michigan. We pray for our region. We pray that you would use us to make kingdom impact and to rebuild together, together in unity, together in harmony, to take, God, the things that have been broken and rebuild them, God, together. We pray this and we ask for it and we ask for your help. Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Now, I have to say this. I want to thank God for my beautiful wife who covered in and filled for me this past Sunday. Can we honor her? We thank God for her. I heard it was a powerful word. I did not have time to watch it, 
Uh, so I'm going to have to at some point find the time to watch it, but I heard she did fantastic, and, and I knew she would, and I'll try to match it as best as I can. <laughs> Amen. Nehemiah chapter 2, the beginning of verse 18 and 20. That's our text this morning. And I'm going to talk today, my title of my sermon this morning is called Rebuilding Together a Good Work. Rebuilding Together a Good Work. Now, can we just say this word together? Would you say that out loud? Together. That's going to be an important word today that we're going to look at, building and rebuilding together. It starts in verse 18 saying, they replied, let us start rebuilding. Let us start rebuilding. And so they began this good work. But then Samballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite, the official of Geshem, the Arab, heard about it. And they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing? They asked. Are you rebelling against the king? And then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper and his servants will arise and build. Will we say this together? Let's rise up. And build. Come on, let's say it again. Let's rise up and build. Amen. Can we praise God for that today? We're rising up and building. But this is what he says. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. Now, I want to begin by, by the preface that rebuilding is different from building. Matter of fact, building is much easier than rebuilding because uh, you know, when you're building from ground up something that's never been built, um, you can do it with ease. The ground is fresh, there's you, it's brand new lumber, there's brand new uh, holes to dig, everything is easy. As a matter of fact, I, I tell young pastors that are wanting to be pastor churches, it's much easier as a Church of God pastor to plant a brand new church than it is to go into a church that's existed for 60 years and try to rebuild. It's much easier because you have established culture, you have established roots, you have established mindsets, and it's very hard to come into old wineskins and put new wine in it. It's very hard because that we, we build, uh, over the years, we build traditions, we build rituals, we, we build ways of thinking that we feel that is right and it's very difficult, especially for young preachers, young pastors to come in. And, and how many of you know change is never easy? It's never easy to, to bring change. But sometimes, and most of the time, change is, is needed. And so I want to look at rebuilding together today. Not building, but rebuilding. How do we, how do we rebuild it? And how do we rebuild our lives personally? I'm not just talking about Stuart Road. I'm talking about you. There's areas in your life that you need rebuild. And it's my heart that, that the years of prayer and the years of dedication and the years that it took to build this church, the years that it's taken to build your life and, and the ministry God has called you, there are some things that we need to rebuild and other things that we just need to build off of. And we have to ask ourselves in, in our lives and in this church, what are the areas that we need to build off of? What are the areas that we need to rebuild off of? Because this word is not only for our church, but it's for you and for your family. God is saying, I want to rebuild some things in your life. I want to rebuild some things in your marriage. I want to rebuild some things in your home. Some of you need financial rebuilding. Some of you, some of you need help in your health. How many, you need some rebuilding of the flesh physically. And God is saying that I want to rebuild some things in you, but it's going to require a new focus. It's going to require a new perspective. It's going to require seeing different than you did before because you're going to have to see in and, and, and ways that, that you haven't looked at and, and, and to move forward and prioritize what God is saying to prioritize and not what just you want to prioritize. Amen? And so Isaiah 58, let's go back to Isaiah today. Isaiah 58 verse 12 says, And they said, That shall be uh, built in old waste places, that shall raise up the foundations of many generations. Now I want to just stop there and look at that word right there, many generations, because that's how God rebuilds. God rebuilds through generations. And what is a sign of a healthy church is a church that manages to have the young and old working together. 
That, and that's one of the first things as a goal of, uh, for me as, as your pastor that I want to do is I'm going to be a Nehemiah, so to speak. And my goal is to build this generation where we work together in unity and in harmony. That we work together hand in hand. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. And, 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 and that's a difficult task. I mean, I've seen many churches separated and split and, and divided, and, and there's, there's churches all over the world. I mean, uh, let's just be honest. You can right now uh, go to a church right here in this area that's full of your pe people just your age, right? You can do that, but you've chosen to be in a church that's multi-generational. You've chosen to be part, and I say, I'll say it this way, a church that's multi-generational is a kingdom church, is a church that looks like, and I'll say this too, a church that's multi-ethnic is a kingdom church. God wants us to be multi-ethnical as well. He wants us to be diverse because that's what the kingdom of heaven looks like. The kingdom of heaven is not black, it's not white, it's not Hispanic. The kingdom of heaven is all people together worshiping the Lord. And so we have to be Flexible. We have to be, if we're going to rebuild, we're going to have to be flexible because God says, I want to work in many generations. And he goes on and says, and that shall be called, listen to this, the repair of the breach. What is the breach? It's the bridge. It's the bridge. I said this several weeks ago that I want to be a bridge builder. I want to be a, a repairer of the past to dwell in. And this church, I just want to prophesy this and speak this into, into this church that we need to repair the path to dwell in so that we can walk together over the bridge together. And the old is not fussing at the young and the young is not fussing at the, at the old, but together grandpas are walking with grandchildren together. That's my heart. That's my prayer. Amen. My prayer is to see together we work. Now, I asked this question several weeks ago, and I want to ask again, what would it look like for you to come to church where your family and your grandchildren and your children worship with you? I guarantee you, you would get over the music style if you could worship with your children and grandchildren. I guarantee you, you would get over the holes in the jeans you wouldn't even care about a hole in the knee, in the knee if, if your son was just coming to church. Oh, it wouldn't even bother you, praise God. See, we got to get over all those little things, and we got to just be a church that repairs the path to dwell in. And God says there's a bridge to build to do so. It's generational. And he says, I want you to dwell in it. I want you to dwell. This is the house of the Lord that I want you to dwell in. But he says, this is my path that I've chosen for you. This is my way that I have for you. Now, Nehemiah 2, 17. Listen to these words. Very similar to Nehemiah, to Isaiah here. Nehemiah says in 2, 17, Then shall I say unto them, you see the distress we're in. You see the distress we're in. Well, let's look at the capital C church. Let's look at us right now, the distress that we're in. There's more bickering in the capital C. I'm not talking about Stewart Road. I'm just talking about the capital C church. I heard Dr. Tim Hill, our general overseer, talk about this. He's talked to me privately about it. He's talked to churches. You can go on YouTube and watch it. That the, that the biggest challenge that the, that the church of God as a denomination has right now is, is that it's in, it's in distress right now because of generational gaps. Generational gaps. And, uh, and you see this, God wants us to find the gaps and fill them. That's what we're doing. We have to locate the gaps. We have to ask God, God, where is there a gap that I can fill? We have financial gaps. We have gaps in this church that generational situations and, and gaps that we need to fill. Gaps on this stage. Gaps outside. Gaps in the community that we need to fill. Gaps uh, that, of people groups that we need to reach. And we need to ask ourselves, God, what have you called us to fill? What have you called us to make a difference about? Amen? You have gaps in your personal life that are in distress. What areas in your life right now are in distress? You need to ask yourself, what are the areas in my life that are in ruins that I need the gaps to be come together and to be fixed? And it says, as he goes on, he says, how Jerusalem lieth in waste. Oh my, you know, there's churches right now that are lying in waste. And it says, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And listen to what he says. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem and let there be no more reproach. 
That's my prayer for us. That's my prayer for you. Maybe in your life today, you've been in reproach for a long time. Your life has been lying in fire and in ruins and you need God to breathe on your life again. You need God to breathe fresh air into your life again. And there are areas in this church right now that I'm praying every day earnestly and asking God, I wanna tell the youth, that's my prayer. My goodness, we need to go beyond 20 people. We need a fresh air in our youth ministry. We need a youth pastor and we need, we need the fire of God to fall on our young people again. Amen. We don't need to be a reproach. We need to be the biggest and baddest and anointed youth ministry in this city. Do you believe it? And by the way, when I say bad, you know what I mean. I'm not saying somebody's going to write me a letter. You know, the pastor said, you know, of course I don't mean bad as in a negative way. I mean as bad to the bone. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Uh, <laughs> it goes on. But he says, he says that we have no more reproach. No more reproach. I, I, I want our church to be a church that doesn't have a, a stain of bad reproach, but a stain that's marked by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That God says, you have been marked by my presence. You've been stained by my presence. You've been stained by my anointing. And this is a place that God says, I want to use for the kingdom of God. Can we give God a hand clap for that? Amen. <laughs> One of my favorite shows growing up as a kid was this old house. Um, I've always loved watching houses be restored. And then you have Chip and Joanna Gaines who, that, 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 that kind of, became the next group that came out uh, after this old house. This old house was way before them. <laughs> and uh, then Chip and Joanna came out with a show. And how many of you love that show? You know, I forget the name of it, but, but they restore homes. And, and they, they work together as a team. Joanna has the vision and Chip builds it. And, and they come in and they restore the home. And what I love about it is, is that Joanna and Chip, they don't destroy the home. They don't, if anything, they, they, uh, they take the parts of the home that were created for its intention, that were like, they'll, they'll remove the carpet and the vinyl. I don't know why people did this years ago, but they would put vinyl on hardwood flooring. But, but now everybody wants hardwood floors. And so they come in and they pull the vinyl off and they go back to that original ship lap and they want those original wooden beams. And I believe that's the way God is with us in this church. I believe God doesn't want to get rid of the old. He doesn't want to get rid of you. We don't want to get rid of the old. We just simply want to enhance the old beauty. Amen. We just want to simply, man, we're going to make you more beautiful and younger. Praise the Lord. Don't, you should get it. Come on, all those in those pink shirts and gray shirts should be like shouting right now. Like, yes, but that's what we're going. And, and so we're not out to get rid, but, but this is, we're building a home that, that just puts on a, a new paint, you know, just a, just a new way of doing things. It doesn't mean the, that, it's the, that we're trying to dispel or get rid of but we got to rebuild the ruins in empty and broken places as we move forward. We're seeking God for breakthrough. We're seeking God for miracles. And that needs to be repurposed in our lives, repurposed for what God wants to do. Amen. Someone has said this. I love this quote. We are all faces with a series of great opportunities, brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. Isn't that a great quote? We are all faces with a series of great opportunities, brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. And so I don't look at problems as problems, I look at them as opportunities. I look at them as disguised as an impossible situation that God wants to work to his good and for his glory. God repurposes us, and this is exactly what Nehemiah did, is he repurposed a broken down wall, and God wants to repurpose your brokenness. God wants to use your sin, your, your brokenness, your pain, your suffering, the things that you have cursed God, and the things that you have uh, cried about and spent tears and labor about. God is saying this to you personally. He's saying that I want to repurpose you. I want to repurpose your marriage. I want to repurpose your home. I want to restore the things that the canker worm has stolen. I want to restore the things that the enemy has stolen. And I want to put it back into your life. I want to reshape your life. I want to redesign your life. I want to remodel your life. Oh, I feel that today. We're in a 
construction zone right here at Stewart Road. And God is restructuring and remodeling our lives. Glory to God. I hear the Holy Ghost saying to me that what we're doing on the outside, don't mistake it as for just an outside thing. But the Holy Ghost just said to me to say that as we remodel the gymnasium and as we do continuous remodels of the parking lot and, and we remodel various areas that need uh, new paint and new different things, the Holy Ghost said that, oh, I'm working on the inside of you. I'm working to remodel and reshape those places in your life. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. Praise the Lord. He repurposes our community. God says, I'm going to repurpose Monroe, and I'm going to use the church to do it. We're not going to wait on the government. We're not going to wait on the governor. We're not going to wait on the mayor. We're going to do it, Stuart Road, right here. One person at a time, we're going to come together and we're going to reshape the walls of our community. And we're going to declare life and not death. We're going to say that we're a place of salvation. We're a place of hope. We're a place of healing. We're a place of victory. Amen. Hallelujah. He's repurposing our community. He's repurposing us from suffering to health. Amen. He's repurposing us from drugs to freedom. He's repurposing us, praise God, from, the, from, from, a, from a place of racism to a place of, of coming together to build the old way play, waste places together. His vision is being repurposed. Some of you in this place today, you've lost vision for your life. You've lost the ability to see one foot in front of you because you're so confused. And I just stand here today prophetically and I say in Jesus' name that I break the spirit of confusion off of your life. I break that cloudy vision. I feel that right now as I'm speaking that some of you have had cloudy vision and you hardly can know where to, how to stand. You, I feel, I don't know who I'm talking to today, but you can hardly get up in the morning because your life is just a state of confusion. Your life is just a state of, of not knowing how to move Move forward, And God says, I don't want you to stay stuck. I don't want you to stay in the same place. I'm going to give you a clear mind to be able to move forward. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Some of you, I think y'all went to Kuwait with me because y'all are more tired than I am. <laughs> Hallelujah. God wants to repurpose your vision. And today we're looking at repurposing our vision. Repurposing our call, repurposing our purpose. God gave Nehemiah a re-identity. He gave him a new identity. One of the things that we need in America, and I'm going to tell you, our Kuwait friends, our brothers and sisters in the Middle East that are serving God all the way in the Middle East, let me tell you what they were telling me. We're praying for America. We're praying for the identity. We're praying that Americans, Christians, would quit walking in sexual immorality and quit walking in the confusion of homosexuality and transgenderism, but they will know who they are in faith, and they're praying that the rainbow would come back to the covenant of God and not pride. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. I declare the rainbow of covenant. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. They said, we're praying for America. We're praying for America. This is in the Middle East. And let me just say this. When I made that declaration and you all were standing, let me just say this. That doesn't mean that I dislike or I hate in any way a certain sin. I hate all sin. I hate all sin. But I'm going to tell you, it's something wrong with a nation that takes what God created, because that's exactly what the devil does. He loves to take and make a mockery of creation. And, I says, and that's, that's what I hate. I just, I, just, I just hate the fact that the devil has come in. And Nehemiah, he's saying, I want to reshape identities. And I believe that that's part of our rebuilding. I believe God is saying that, look, you're not going to be a cat. You're not going to be a dog. You're not going to have no desire to go to some, some uh, box to, uh, to go to the bathroom. You're a, you are a human being created in the image of God. Hallelujah. You've been made by him and created by him. And the Bible says in Genesis that he made them male and female. God wasn't confused. Praise God. He knew. But Satan comes in like a thief into the night. 
and he wants to destroy identities. But here's the thing. Nehemiah says he's going to repurpose the thinking and perspective. And I'm not just talking about the thinking and perspective of our identity. Some of us need to shape, rethink our faith. Our faith has gotten stale. Our faith has gotten old. Even the way we do things, it just stinks. It just stinks in the way we think. And some of us got stinking thinking, and because we have stinking thinking, we have a stinking life. Because you don't have a stinking life until you have stinking thinking. And the Bible says that we have to renew our mind daily according to the word of God. He told Joshua, he said, he said to Joshua, he said, he said, I want you to go and prepare yourself and, and, and sanctify yourself and prepare for tomorrow. You're going to go over and cross the Jordan. And God is speaking that into this body today. He's saying that we need to sanctify ourselves. We need to consecrate ourselves and we need to prepare ourselves because God says, I want to take you where you've never dreamed possible. I want you to go play you've never went, but it must require a consecrating and a sanctification process, praise God. You know, in the old days in the church of God, they even have it where I have to, I, it's a hard report to do, but, it, but years ago, the church of God had altar calls for sanctification. How many of you old timers remember that? You had, we had altar calls for sanctification, asking God to sanctify our minds and our souls and spirits that we would be made new in Jesus Christ. And our denomination still believes that's a sacred call and part of our Pentecostal doctrine and part of our faith that when God saves us, he sanctifies us and he makes us a new creature in Christ Jesus and the old is passed away. And behold, I become new in Christ Jesus. That's what sanctification is. Sanctification is the ability of God not only to save you but to purify you of your sins that you want to be a new person you want to be a person that drops cigarettes that drops alcohol that drops all the things of this world and says God I am now made new in Christ Jesus somebody says well why do I got to drop cigarettes because cigarettes will kill you before it's your time to die amen you don't have to be bound by that mess you can be free. And I don't mean I'm condemning you if you do it in here. I'm not condemning you. I'm not saying that it's going to send people to hell and it's, it's, it's going to mess you up or make your faith bad. I'm not saying that. But I am saying this, that you could get cancer and then you're going to pray for healing. Right? Yeah. And it's the same thing for fat people too. <laughs> I mean, you're going to pray for, I'm talking to myself. I know I'm thinking to my own self as well. You can't call out one sin and not call out the rest. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, it's amazing. We ask God to, to heal us, but we aren't sanctified. I don't know why I'm going here with this, but I'm saying we're asking, we come to the altar crying, God heal us. And God says, you've got to sanctify yourself first. You've got to repent. You've got to get rid of the works of the flesh and, and become right with me. We want God to just touch us like Burger King. Have it my way. God says it's not going to be like Burger King. I'm not a Burger King God. I'm not a microwave God. I'm a crock pot God. You've got to get in the heat of God and let, his, and let the heat of God refine you with the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. America has a sin problem. That's a sin issue. I went to Kuwait and I, I witnessed, my Lord, I, I witnessed the power of God in the Church of God churches in, uh, in Kuwait. I saw six congregations in the Church of God come together. Man, those people, they convicted me. I ain't, I'm not kidding you. I walked in and I started watching them worship. And I was, I was griping in my room. I'll be honest. I was griping. Here, I was griping about, I don't want to sit through this long service. I'm tired. I'm worn out. And I was really griping about the heat. Oh, Lord of mercy. 120 degrees and hot. And I mean, oh, I'm telling you guys. It was brutally hot. 
brutally hot. I had forgotten how hot it was when I lived there. I guess you, you get used to it after a while, but I, had not, I was not used to it. And I'm going to tell you, the, the conviction power of the Holy Ghost got a hold of me when I started worshiping the Lord, and I repented right there on the spot. And I said, Lord, forgive me for my... These people are living in such impoverished conditions. These people, most of them, you should see the conditions that they live in. And yet, when they come into the house of God, they are worshiping him passionately. They, they, are, they are on fire with the Lord. I sent some of our council, I sent, as a matter of fact, our whole council in a text message. Just to, I said, watch these people worship. And I'm telling you, it's something on the inside of me began to convict me. And that's what mission strips usually do. They, God gets a hold of us and changes us. Amen. And God's telling us, he's telling at the church of America, we got to get right with God. He wants to rebuild us, but we got to make it right. And so we need, a new pers- we need a new perspective, and we need God to help us in getting it right. Nehemiah's leadership was not only was his vision redone, but his, uh, his leadership was reimagined. Why did the walls need to be rebuilt? Many Christians Excuse me, many of the Jewish people could have rebuilt the wall, but God had to use somebody uh, miles and miles away in a palace to get a hold of. I wonder why no one else was available to God. I wonder why God had to go that far and get a hold of one person that wasn't even a, a king or a prophet, wasn't anybody special. He was just a layman. He was just a, a cupbearer of the king. And, and I wonder how God just, just had to say, I'm going to use this guy to do that. I believe that thousands of years later, God is still saying the thing, same thing, that he's not looking for anyone special. He's looking for availability. He's looking for somebody that would say, I want to reimagine your leadership. I'm telling you, if we're going to rebuild, everyone in this room under the sound of my voice has to say, God, repurpose my way of thinking so you can say as we sung at the last song, God, use me. Use me to help rebuild the walls of this church. Use me. Use me. Look at some of the things that they rebuilt. They rebuilt God's honor. They rebuilt God's honor. The Bible says that the remnant that are left of the capacity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. Nehemiah 1 3. They were in great affliction. Can I tell you, it breaks God's heart when we don't step into the rightful position that we're called to step in. It breaks his heart. And God is saying, I want a church, I'm looking for a kingdom church. A church that will do my beckoning, a church that will do my work, a church that will be a giving church, a church that will be a working church, a church that will be a serving church, a church that will love one another. Let's just start with the basics. Love one another. That will love God and love each other as God loves us. That's the first and second commandment. Amen? Number two, not only do we, when we rebuild, that we rebuild for God's honor, but we rebuild for God for our protection. We rebuild for our protection. Look at, uh, I believe it's in chapter four, verses seven. Uh, I'm going to read it. Verses seven said that now that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Amorites and the Ashadites heard the repair of the walls of Jerusalem went on, and that the breaches began to be closed. And they were angry. Verse 8 says, And so all of them conspired together to come fight against Jerusalem and cause confusion in it. Satan is always dividing and confusing, confusing people. And he uses church people to do it. It's not worldly people. The world could care less what we're doing. They could care less. No one's going to like drive past us and say, Wow, that's a big church. They don't care. They don't don't have... You heard that little kid, it's like, wow. Amen, I love that. I love that. God, say, uh, uh, the world is not interested. They don't care whether, what we're doing. They don't care if we're growing or not growing. It, it's, it's, the, it's the Christians that have to have our stuff together. We're the ones that, that are gonna have uh, people that are gonna 
uh, squabble against one another, squabble against one another that are going to come against one another. And, and we need this for God's protection. Why? So that we can be protected and covered under the blood of Jesus so that when the enemy does come against us, that we can stand against the wiles of the enemy. Praise God, that we can stand and be firm. Ephesians 6 says to stand. And when you've done all that you know to do, you stand therefore. And that's what God has called us to do. He hasn't called us to weeble. He hasn't called us to wobble. He hasn't called us to shake or to move. God says, I want you to stand. I want you to stand firm in the faith and fight the good fight of faith together. Praise God. Give God a hand clap for that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Protection. Protection. Number, th number three, uh, we're talking about why does God want to rebuild us? Number three, to, to reestablish his church. In the Old Testament, it was to reestablish the nation of Israel. Under the new covenant, God says, I want you to reestablish my church. I want you to reestablish uh, my church that it will be without. God is looking. He says he's not going to return until he has a church without spot or blemish. So all these people that are talking about Jesus is coming back tomorrow. I, the last thing I looked, we're a very messed up church, capital C church. We've got a lot of work to do. There's a lot of inward focusing. There's a lot of arguing and fighting amongst one another. And God says I, that he will return when his church is without spot or blemish. That means that we are full of the spirit of the living God. And we're not, that's in Acts chapter two, the Bible said that the day of Pentecost had, had come when they were all together and and unity. God is looking. He wants to fill this church with revival. He wants to fill this church with his mission. He wants to fill this church with his power, but he's looking for a church that will say together, young and old, female and male, together, I, I, every generation coming together, he's looking for a people that will say to God, we shall work together. We'll work together. We'll work together. And so, God wants to reestablish the church again. And number four, God wants to <clears throat> eliminate separation. God doesn't operate in separation. He operates in a community. The walls, could, um, the walls would, would be a place of, of bringing to get the people together to not separate them, but to bring the people together so that the heathen nations could not come in the heathen nations could not uh, over, overturn them. And that was the biggest issue because uh, in the Old Testament, that during that time, uh, that nothing was safe unless it had a wall. Even today in, in Africa, true story, I want to share it with you. Uh, in Africa, uh, a friend of mine was pa uh, pastoring a church in Africa and he built a church, and, uh, but he did not have a wall built around it. And he had spent... Uh, thousands upon thousands of dollars to build this church. And uh, because it did not have a wall, it was completely overtaken by the community. And the community used it. I mean, millions were lost due to that. And it was over a simple mistake of not building a wall around the church. What does that mean for you and I? I'm not talking about a wall to prevent people from coming out. I'm not talking coming in. I'm not talking about a wall like that we put up. We put up walls for our, in our own, own self. We put up walls because we've been hurt before. And really, that's why a lot of times we have walls in our life. But I'm not talking about those kind of walls. I'm not talking about walls that come from hurt. I'm not talking about walls that come from shame and guilt that we build ourselves. Those are self-built walls. I'm talking about a God-built wall. <laughs> totally different here. A God-built wall is a wall that says, I'm going to keep the enemy out. <laughs> oh, praise God. I'm talking about the wall of tithing. When you tithe to the Lord, the Bible says that I will stand out as a wall in front of the enemy and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. That anytime the enemy wants to come in like a flood, the Bible says, I will raise up a standard against the enemy. Praise God. Why? Because when you put God first, he puts you first. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Yeah. Hallelujah. I'm talking about a wall that God says, I'm going to put around you that when, when the world is is, is overcome, you're not going to be overcome because I've made you to be overcomers in Christ Jesus. I'm talking about a separation that, that not, not a wall that we build. Can I tell you, we need to tear down walls that we build and build walls that God builds. Amen. Woo! Yeah. Hallelujah. Nehemiah prayed. He prayed. And he prayed a powerful prayer. Let's look at the prayer that he prayed in verse 6. He said, Lord God of heaven, 
the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keeps his commandments. Let your eyes be open and your ears be attentive to hear your servant's prayer. That now I pray to you that day and night, your servants, the Israelites, I confess the sins we have committed against you. Both I and my father's house have sinned. Notice what he says, both I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted corruptly towards you and have not kept your commandments. We haven't kept your statutes. We haven't kept your ordinance. And you gave that you gave your servant Moses. So what did Nehemiah do? Nehemiah, he took the bricks of the community, each brick at a time. And before he could build the walls, before he could take the bricks of rubbish, before he could repurpose the bricks that had been laid before his forefathers, they're bricks in this room today, they're bricks in your life that the enemy has said to us and to you that you are no longer usable, that we are no longer usable. And God is saying that I will take the waste places, that I will take the bricks and I will, I will take the bro broken bricks and I will repurpose them for your life and you can build again. You can build the areas that, that Satan has put a tombstone on and said, no, you're defeated. No, you're gonna die. No, you're gonna, you're gonna always be this way. Somebody needs to hear me say this. I feel it in my spirit as I'm saying it. The enemy has lied to you and say, it's gonna, he said this over you. He spoke, I see the words. It will always be this way. And I, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke that tag off of your life and I say it will not always be this way. God has something for you. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Nehemiah, Nehemiah prayed and he, when he prayed, he focused on the nature of God. And sometimes some of you in here, when you're rebuilding, you'll lose focus and you'll forget about his nature, but he's a sovereign God. And he said to this in verse five, he said, God, you are the God of heaven. When Nehemiah said those words, God, you're the God of heaven, what he was saying is he saw that everything was at his disposable. Everything was at his covenant. Everything was at his level. In other words, some of you today, when you're looking at the rubbish of your life, when you're looking at the broken places of your life, you just need to lift up your hands and close your eyes and say, God, you are sovereign. God, I don't know why I'm going through this divorce, but you are sovereign. God, I don't know why I lost this loved one in my life that died suddenly and died too soon, but God, you are sovereign. God, I don't know why my country is going through hell like it is, even though we're praying, God, you are the God of heaven. You're the God of the universe. You're the great I am. God, you're sovereign. And some of you have got to simply trust the sovereignty of God, that God is in control of your mess, that God is in control of your brokenness. And you just need to say, God, I trust you, even though I feel broken. Amen. I think many times we as Pentecostals, because we believe in healing. We believe in divine healing. But if we're not careful, we'll focus on the, what God can do for us and what we define God to do. Oh, did you just hear what I said? She heard it. So, so here's what we'll do. Our prayers look like this oftentimes. God, this is the way that I want you to do it. I want you to bring her or him back to me. And God says, you don't want that fool to come back to you. <laughs> or this, God, I need a mate in my life. And your flesh couldn't control a mate. It couldn't control. God, I really, I really want to be called into full-time ministry. And if God answered that prayer for you today, Satan would eat you for lunch. Eat you for lunch. Huh. I talked to so many young ministers, and I'm like, do you really want to do this? Man, I think you should just go to work at Walmart, seriously. Nothing wrong with Walmart, praise God, go. I said, I'm not thinking badly about where, in, in that case, but I mean, do you really, really? 
Because I'm going to tell you, people can be mean. Ministry is a, a battle. When you're doing things for the Lord, you have a target on your back. And you have to know that you know who you are in Christ Jesus. I hear, I hear young ministers in our denomination say all the time, you know, oh, I want a big church. No, you don't. Big church means bigger problems. It really does. You're unifying 20 people versus 2,500 people. Imagine that. It's, it's, a lot, it's a lot that goes into it. And so, and so God, Nehemiah prayed, God, you are sovereign. In other words, Nehemiah had no plan at this point to do what he called him to do. He's like, oh God, you are sovereign in mercy. You are sovereign in goodness. You are the God of heaven of the universe. I mean, he was so excited. This man was a prayer warrior. He had been fasting and praying. And then all of a sudden he says, tag, you're it. Can I say this to you this morning? It's not in my notes, so it's free. <laughs> just kidding. I don't know why I say that. It's just a dumb quote, but whatever. <laughs> Prayer is not for you to change things. Prayer is for God to change you. I think that deserves a hand clap. <laughs> Meanwhile, while God's changing you, he is changing people in the world. But God changes us. He changes our heart. And I'm going I'm to move to this and then I'm going to wrap up. So musicians, if you want to come and, and prepare yourself, I'm, I'm finishing. He trusted God with his covenant. And what he, mean by, what he meant by that is he said, you are a covenant keeping God. In other words, what Nehemiah done is Nehemiah stood on the word of God. See, you can't stand on your foundation. You have to stand on his foundation. Your foundation will fail you. Your faith will fail you. But if you, if you stand on the covenant of God and you say, God, your word is, 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 is yes and amen. Your promises are yes and amen. That you are the firm foundation. And God, you said it, you will do it. And even though you're still in rubble, even though you're still in rubbish, even though the bricks are all around you and everywhere you look, it doesn't seem like nothing is happening. That's why I love that, the worship song. Even though you can't see it, he's still working in you. What's that name of that song, son? Even though you can't see it, he's working. Waymaker. I, I, I think that's my favorite song. One of my favorites now. He's still working. When you can't see it, he's still applying his covenant. Man will give up on you. This preacher may give up on you because I'm a man too. This church may give up on you and your friends and family may give up on you. But God has an everlasting covenant that you can stand upon and you can say, God, I need your covenant to work in my life. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Somebody needs to hear me say this this morning. You need to hear me say this. You're fighting and you're battling to hold on to the faith because nothing seems like it's working the way you had hoped or dreamt or imagined. And your faith is, is grown weary. Notice scripture says that you grow weary in well-doing. It's the well-doing that makes you weary. What makes us weary is, is doing the right thing over and over again and not seeing results. That's what makes us weary. And I feel like I just, I need to say this, this is in my spirit to say this, that in your weariness is when you have to trust this covenant. You have to say, God, if, this is going to blow you away, what I'm about to say, but God, if, I'm going to take the timeline off of you. I'm going to take, because how many of you know, God doesn't operate under chronos. We operate under chronos time. That's why we often are constantly putting God under the watch. God says, I don't operate that way. I operate on kairos. <laughs> Meaning that supernaturally, when you don't even expect it, 
God opens a door and a window. I've watched this happen over and over again in my own family, haven't we, Christy? Over and over again, praying and believing God for God to do something and weary in it. I'm not going to lie to you and say, oh, we weren't weary. We were strong. No, we were weary. But what we kept doing is we kept saying, God, I thank you for your covenant. I thank you for your covenant. I thank you for your covenant. I thank you. And, and here's when prayer becomes powerful. Prayer becomes powerful when you begin to yield to him and you sing songs like this. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my precious Savior. I surrender all. Come on, let's sing that chorus one more time. Stand up on your feet. I surrender all. Come on, let's sing that together. I surrender all. All to Thee, my precious Savior. I surrender all. As they're playing and they're going to sing and continue to sing, if you need to surrender something to God, maybe you need to surrender the chaos. Maybe you need to surrender the rubble. Maybe you need to surrender some pain. Oh, I feel that. I feel that. I've been saying this for weeks. You need to surrender some unforgiveness. You need to surrender some unforgiveness. You need to surrender some, some things that you have told God, God, you've got to do it this way. And you need to say, God, I'm not going to ask you any longer that you have to do it this way. But God, I'm going to surrender my prayer for the prayer that you prayed to, to God the Father. You said, God, not my will, but your will be done. And on earth as it is in heaven. Today, the altar is open. I'm going to ask altar workers, those that are my altar workers, to spread out at the altar, to spread out those that are called to pray with people, to spread out. And those that are coming up for prayer, please come to an altar worker and they will begin praying with you. Let's worship.